Today on Between the Lines, an actress and comedian who transcended her disability and continues to encourage others, Jerry Jewell. Welcome, I'm Barry Kibrick. Jerry broke new ground in Hollywood when she became the first person with a visible disability to have a primetime television role as Cousin Jerry on The Facts of Life. Years later, a new generation was moved by her remarkable performance in the acclaimed series Deadwood. Now, with her candid memoir, I'm walking as straight as I can, Jerry's inspiring story gives us a rare glimpse of true courage and perseverance. But I'm a writer today because I was a reader when I was 11 years old, and it was- You do, need to, need, you do not need to prove your state of happiness to anybody. Most of these speeches were as much as a month in preparation. The characters, the heroes in this book, are seekers of truth in, in a story that, that involved a lot of corruption. You don't get a chance to really talk about what's real. And that is the first thing to do. Jerry, it is a true pleasure having you on the set here. Welcome to Between the Lines. Uh, thank you. It's mutual, likewise. Uh, I'm going to begin in a way with the attitude that you begin the book with. I was born with cerebral palsy, but I can only be a victim of it if I choose. Yes, that is how I started it, and that has been my primary attitude for my life. But it seems that it's almost, and should be, the primary attitude for everyone's life. <laughs> uh, I mean, without having to be cerebral palsied. I mean, you know, everyone m is dealing with what they have to deal with, and they can choose to be a victim or not. It, uh, I believe it always is a choice. And if you're feeling like you are a victim, you have to shift that attitude yourself. It doesn't come from outside of us. It comes from within. Well, you know, you can you can tell that because when you talk about your family, and I get a good sense that, at least especially for the times, they were as supportive as, as they could be. I mean, they were really supportive. Absolutely. But it has no doubt, as you say, when you're a, a, a born with a disability, it affects the whole family chain of events. It does. Because you don't expect to give birth to a child with a disability. You know, it's like if you book a flight to Spain and you land in Holland. <laughs> it's, it's like, well, okay, this isn't Spain, <laughs> but let's deal with Holland. Oh, God. <laughs> now, so, but your parents dealt with it good, and you were also blessed with teachers. Yes. Like Mrs. Olds, you mentioned uh, oh, in the yes. show. And, and what... What really took you was when people raised the bar of expectation that you then had to meet rather than lower the bar to think Always. that they were pleasing you. The teachers that I remember the most to this day are those who raised the bar and not let me slide. And these are the teachers that impacted my life the greatest. And the first one, as you mentioned, was Hazel Lowe's, 18 months old. You know, she was my teacher from 18 months until age seven. Seven years of Hazel Olds. <laughs> and she pushed all of us kids. She only taught children with cerebral palsy. So all my classmates had CP too. Isn't that a trip? <laughs> wow. Yeah. But, but you know, there, but there's something about that you say because you do develop your own empathies Yes. When, you're, when, when you see even people either like yourself or in sometimes way worse conditions, because mm -hmm. than, I know it's, it's sort of a spectrum, cerebral yeah, palsy. There's always a spectrum with, with all disabilities. There's right. a range. And you do learn empathy early on and, and compassion. And Hazel Olds, you know, interesting. I brought up um, an article about her on the computer about two months ago, just found it out of the blue. And she had gotten in a horrible car accident and was laid up in the hospital. And they did this whole article on her. This was like maybe eight, nine months before she got me as her student. 
And the article said, well, this is no big deal. I've got to get back to teaching those kids. I've got other things to do with my life. <laughs> I can't be laid up in a hospital. That sums up his all. <laughs> oh. I mean, she had to learn how to walk again after a horrific car accident. And she wasn't going to, she had the same standards for her kids with CP. You know, you're going you're gonna to do the best you can, and you're going to be pushed because I'm not going to be easy on you. Well, and you know what the best thing was, was not only did she push you, but then I guess internally you developed that same thought and mechanism. And you talk about getting on a skateboard and riding bicycles. I can't. The bicycle, oh, yeah. I could imagine. The skateboard, though, that would seem difficult. You joke about your <laughs> balance, you know, and the skateboard, though, amazing. Yeah, and you know, every psychologist will tell you that the most important years in development of all of us is from age zero to age five. And if you think about it, <laughs> I had Hazel Oates <laughs> and my mother <laughs> in between the two. It's not surprising that I would get on a skateboard. <laughs> and I loved it. And the most amazing thing is that when I was on the skateboard, I had perfect balance. It was like the CP disappeared when I was on the skateboard, mind over matter. And the minute I would get off the skateboard, I'd trip. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, amazing. And I, oh, oh, I just. But you know, you're also brutally honest and brutally funny. I will tell people this book you will you will you will be rooting and knowing that Jerry's done the most amazing stuff and then you will have to cross your legs so you don't you know what in your pants because I know. You, you have both of those abilities. And one of them is this ability to talk seriously about the gaps, as you call them, in your life. And I want to use your words because again, I think although they are personal to you, I think they will, will touch everyone. And it says, I had so many gaps in my development, but all survivors have gaps in their development. In order to survive, one cannot always be focused on each stage of development at that time. Yep, and that's true. And that's a very solid truth because survivors of anything, whatever you're surviving, um, you need to focus your attention on survival and then you miss certain developmental stages, which can or cannot catch up with you later in life. Debatable for everyone. Everybody has a different journey. Well, you're, and here is one where I, I would find myself between sentences cracking up and crying and it's when you discuss sexuality. Because yes. that, that for you, you're, you know where I'm going with this. Sexuality has been a stumbling block for me for as long as I can remember. And it's funny because it, on, it, it seemed like it was on more than one level. It was on the fact that A, you thought you should be a boy. You felt yes. much more comfortable being a boy. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, because of your own development, you weren't even aware of sexuality when most kids become aware no. of it. So you didn't know that you were necessarily gay. You didn't even know the concept as much as, as you'd, you'd think. Couldn't even comprehend it. I, it didn't register. It didn't compute. And, you know, in the old school, there was always this assumption that people with disabilities are asexual. I disagree with it. I do not believe that that was the issue. The issue is, is that you're protected and isolated so much, and you top that off with not having any social experiences to grow sexually, that you do become a bit asexual, but not because it's a part of the disability, but it's a part of the conditioning and what you come into the world and how people treat you then it becomes stagnant because you're not giving the opportunities to grow sexually. Oh, and then that's why it obviously became so confusing because when people were literally making even positive advances to some extent, you... It went over my head. <laughs> I didn't get it. 
until, oh, was that sex? <laughs> oh, oh my. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to stop. I know we could talk about sex, by the way, in this book for a long time. We may get back to it, but I do, because of the, the breakthrough work that did occur, I want to get into the showbiz a little bit because mm -hmm. the fascination with showbiz for you began at a very early age. And as you said, wanting a career as an entertainer with cerebral palsy seemed virtually illogical to everyone. It and yet did. you knew that that's what it's going to be. I knew. I knew. And oddly enough, the most influential people in my choices in show business were Judy Garland, Carol Burnett, and David Cassidy. <laughs> Go figure. Well, David Cassidy, I know. I read the book. You were in love with David Cassidy. So let's, or at least what you, you felt you know, you know infatuated. You know what I think it was, Barry? I, th I think I wanted to be David Cassidy. <sighs> you know, because, you left that out. Because that was the image in which I saw myself as androgynous, you know, a waif, and that's how I saw myself. So David Cassidy was an extension of the ideal self as I saw me. Oh, gosh, that's an insight. That, that's, that's... Well, I'm being real honest with you. I love that. I love that because I didn't pick that up. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't in the book that way. So that was a deep insight. That's, mm -hmm. Did that come after you read it, after you wrote the book, or did that, was that something you had within you from before? That's something that I've always been aware of, and friends have pointed it out to me more than I did. Wow. And I was like, yeah, I guess, yeah, because... The question was, how could I be so attracted to David Cassidy when, in fact, I was gay? Oh. And the answer is, is because David Cassidy symbolically was how I perceived myself. Well, you know, though, <laughs> even reading it, the sheer persistence, and also I want to p let people know, you know, they, they know you from Facts of Life, and now, mm -hmm. as I said, my son and, and the new generation knows you from Deadwood, like, oh, yeah. you know, as, as, as a major uh, performer and, and star. And yet at the same time, throughout this, you're really struggling. You know, yeah. Facts of Life, like you say, you know, it's one thing to have a 30-minute segment of something, but mm -hmm. life is not cut up in 30-minute segments. You were struggling. You had managers that took advantage of you. Oh, you had yes. situations where you didn't really see the money that you no. were supposed to have, and you were really in pain. I was. I was in a lot of psychological and emotional and spiritual pain. The fact that I survived all that is because of my friendships and my family and I was always spiritually grounded, Barry, always. Even in the struggle, I had spiritual grounding, which I think was my saving grace, because I've always believed that it was my choice to come into the world with cerebral palsy, and it was always my choice to make the choices that I've made in my life. So if I'm going to sit and wallow it in it, the only person I really have to blame <laughs> is me. Oh, but you know, you, and you, you stay, I, I, I really want to use your words just to reinforce that. Wisdom tells me that there are no accidents in mm -hmm. life. And that's what, th that's what that's all about. And, and perhaps the pain and agony I went through was necessary for me to grow and evolve. So you really Absolutely. embraced it. Absolutely, and I thoroughly believe that, even to this day. I'm, and I'm probably harder on myself than anybody else could ever be on me, because my expectations of myself as a spiritual being are very high. Well, you also said that not only hard on yourself, but the anger because you don't take out or believe it's the other person's fault. Sometimes the anger 
even turns inward. Yeah, I turn it inward, and I have to back up and say, wait, Jay, did you cause World War II, too? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I do believe in taking responsibility for my actions. But you're careful, and I always like to use this distinction, not necessarily to blame yourself. That's where the spiritual grounding mm, comes yeah. in. Am I right? You'll take the responsibility, but you're not going to burden yourself with blame. Yes, and that's the balance. And I've gotten better with that. I think in my 20s, especially in my 20s, <laughs> that was when I beat myself up horribly because I thought, oh, God, how could I do this? How could this be happening? How could I have no money? How could I have no job? <laughs> how could I? I? I was just so lost because I was totally unprepared for the wolves in sheepskin. And I really, honestly, was that naive at that time in my life. Today, I'm not. But back then, oh, God, yes. Oh, you, you as I say, <laughs> you're, you're, I know you're <laughs> laughing because it's very, this is what makes it, a, it's a weird feeling sometimes to read something like this is, you're reading something that's so horribly happening to you, and then you just put it into perspective just like that, and boom, there's a sense of resolve. There's a sense almost like a, a, a revelation that, you know something? I, like you just said, I didn't start World War II. How <laughs> bad can I be? <laughs> exactly, and that would be going to the other extreme. And that's where I had to fight back to the middle because I had a tendency to be so hard on myself. And I think that comes from being segregated early on in special education schools and being bused far away. You get this feeling that you're different than everybody else because society keeps telling you that. So you naturally are inclined to think you're the one that did this, you did this, you're being bused to school. You're being sent far away. And I think you have this image of yourself as, you know, uh, you know what it is? I think, especially if you come into the world with a disability and not acquire one later, but I think you, there's this unspoken feeling that because of you, who you are, and you've come into the world this way, that you are somehow burdening society. So you come in with this guilt for having the disability, not embarrassment. I was never embarrassed about having a disability. That, some people think, God, that must be really embarrassing to walk like that out in public. I never felt that. Guilt, yes. You know, like if I need, uh, an extra, like I, like I couldn't drink from this glass of water. If I bring that, I will probably give you a baptism. <laughs> <laughs> or at least a spit take, for sure. Yeah, and then you ask if you have a straw and a, and a lid. I used to feel so guilty asking for it, because I'm asking for someone to do something special that they wouldn't do for someone else. You know, it, this is funny, but reading the book, I almost had an opposite interpretation of it. Let me, let me share it with you for a moment, okay? And I'll, and I'll tell you what it was. Because of your perseverance, because of the way you took responsibility for your own sanity, help, health, I, you met in the green room, uh, a dear friend of ours, Peggy, and she just wrote a, a beautiful poem. I'm even going to put it in my blog about a, a, a person on a mission. And sometimes I got the sense that you were on a mission and that the mission sometimes itself was so hard to live up to that that's what sort of made you feel that way. Isn't that funny from, from reading this? There's probably layers of that. There's probably the two components together. You're right. There is a bit of that in me also. Oh. Yes. 
Isn't it funny? Because you, you, reading through it, I just said there has to be that. You can't have that much inner confidence or strength without that also having some backlash. No, you can't. Absolutely. You, that was very perceptive of you. That's very true. Wow, you did so good. Now, <laughs> chapter 20. <laughs> Stop you laughing. Let me at least set it up what makes it so funny, okay? I'm trying to be a straight man here, all right? So chapter 20 is nothing. You go to chapter 20 and you turn the page. There is no chapter 20. It's a blank page. And symbolically, the blank page says nothing. These are your words, but reveals everything. And this was about your marriage to mm -hmm. Richard who you do get into later, but chapter 20 is a blank page. Actually, it is a blank page on, on Kindle. <laughs> no, it's not. Don't lie to me. I checked it, in fact, because when I did that, it was the first thing I did. The first thing I did was go, oh, wait a minute. I wonder if this is a mistake in Kindle, and I got the book, so you can't <laughs> fake me out. No, wait a minute. Give me, that, give me a chance here, Barry. <laughs> No, because I downloaded the book, you know, electronically, and it is one blank page. But in the book, it's three blank pages. Oh, okay. I was <laughs> it's more important in the book, then. <laughs> yes, because, and truthfully, how that came about was Richard was probably the most difficult part of the book for me to write. Out of everything that, I've already, that I wrote about, he was the most difficult. And I thought, how in the world can I write about Richard and do it in a way that is spiritually the right way to write? And a friend of mine told me, don't write about him at all. Just skip over him. And I said, I'm not going to do that because Richard had a film that he did on his life. and. I was with Richard, I was married to Richard for 12 years, Richard, with him for 14. And in this whole film about Richard, there was not one mention of me. Not even a thank you at the end of the film, thank you Jerry, <laughs> for your input. Nothing. So I was literally erased. And there were reasons why. Only Richard would know all the reasons. But that hurt me more deeply than I ever thought. I mean, I was so discounted. I thought, how could I be with someone for that long and be discounted so gigantically publicly? I'm not going to do that to Richard because the pain is too deep. I want to value the gifts that he gave me. Yes, the marriage didn't work out. Yes, there were problems. Yes, there were things that he did that I'm, I'm not too fond of. But you know what? Um, again, there were no accidents. And Richard and I came together for a reason. He fulfilled whatever needs I had, and I fulfilled whatever needs he had. There was a purpose for that. But you know, as you said about your own spirituality in the book, you said, we broke the cardinal spiritual law, chasing happiness outside of ourselves instead of realizing that true happiness can only come from within. Exactly, Barry. That's what I'm telling you. That's what we came into each other's lives to reflect back to one another so that we would stop doing that. Jerry, we found that through each other, as you, painful as it was. You are so beautiful, but our time is up. I have to end with these words. I value taking risks in life. It is the risk takers who realize their dreams. And I want to thank you, Jerry, for taking those risks and sharing your dreams with us. Oh, thank you, Barry. It means so much to be on this show with you. I've, I've looked forward to this for so long. 
Uh, it is my honor and on my blessing, and I want to thank you. And I want to thank you guys for joining us. Now, before Jerry leaves, I'd like to leave you with these few more words from I'm Walking As Straight As I Can. The challenge for all of us is to overcome the negativity that can destroy our dreams and belittle our faith. We need to believe in ourselves when others don't believe in us, because ultimately what we believe about ourselves is what is reflected back to us and to everyone else. I'm Barry Kibrick. Between all the daily challenges that we all need to overcome, the biggest one is to keep that belief about ourselves. Thank you, Miss Jules. You were lovely. Thank you, Barry. My pleasure. Closed captioning for Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible by your generous contributions to KLCS Education Foundation. Thank you for your support. If you'd like to get in touch with us, want a DVD or transcript of our show, catch an episode online, or receive our weekly updates, go to www.klcs.org slash btl. And go further between the lines by visiting Barry's blog at www.barrykibrickblogs.com. Struggle, I had spiritual grounding, which I think was my saving grace. On this episode of Between the Lines, an actress and comedian who transcended her disability and continues to encourage others, Jerry Jewell. With her memoir, I'm Walking as Straight as I Can, Jerry's inspiring story gives us a rare glimpse of true courage and perseverance.